Hello, I'm Ron Vail, and today I'd like to tell you about experiments that led to the discovery of a new type of microtubule motor protein called kinesin. And in this talk, I'd like to highlight this experiment shown in this video, where kinesin motors are attached onto a glass cover slip and are transporting these microtubules across the glass. And I'll explain to you why this experiment came as a complete and utter surprise to us, and also how this experiment changed the course of the research project, but also changed the course of my life and career as well. But before I go into these experiments, I'd just like to share some general thoughts with you about scientific discovery. We often teach that the way scientific discoveries are made is through a process called the scientific method. And you can see many different versions of them here. But they mostly reduce to a, a similar theme of first coming up with a question, then developing a hypothesis, and then doing experiments to test that hypothesis, analyzing the data, and then coming to a conclusion. Now, many of the scientific projects that I've been involved with haven't followed such a linear path and been so predictable. Oftentimes, you get started with an idea, but then the experiments take you in all kinds of different directions. And there are various twists and turns that happen in a project. And then maybe, if you're very lucky, you come across, in one of your experiments, some really unexpected result that tells you something very important and very new about biological systems. And I'd like to illustrate that with the story that I'm going to tell you. And this story, I think, is very much like uh, a detective whodunit story, where we started off following, in fact, the most obvious suspect, but only found out later that that suspect uh, was not correct and we were on the wrong track. So then we had to go back and uh, find new clues, develop new pieces of evidence, put things together in a new way that got us back on the right track and allowed us to come up uh, with the correct answer. And indeed, many scientific projects are really like detective stories. So today, I'd like to share with you uh, my detective story uh, that started off when I was an MD, PhD student in the lab of uh, Eric Schuter. And I was interested in this problem of how uh, material is transported inside of nerve cells. In particular, I was studying this one hormone called nerve growth factor, which interacts with receptors at the nerve terminal. And then some message must get transmitted back through this axon back to the cell body. But this axon, in fact, can be fantastically long. Uh, even uh, in a mature motor neuron in your body, uh, the distal tip of that nerve terminal may be at the tips of your toe. That axon from that one nerve cell travels all the way up your leg. And then the, spinal, uh, then the cell body would be in your spinal cord. So to transport material over this long distance, there had to be some machinery that was moving material inside the axon. But in 1983, very little was known about what that machinery was. Um, but an opportunity to begin to understand this problem came about uh, uh, actually one floor below me at Stanford in the laboratory of uh, Jim Spudich, where a very exciting experiment was going on uh, between Jim and a sabbatical professor, Mike Sheets. And what Jim and Mike were trying to do was uh, to develop in vitro assay to study muscle contraction. And what they did in their experiment was, first of all, to purify muscle myosin, and then uh, add that purified muscle myosin onto plastic beads. And then they added these myosin-coated beads onto actin cables, which were derived from a plant cell nitella. And you can see these beads, actually clumps of beads, being transported uh, along these actin cables. And from watching these movies that I saw one floor below me downstairs, it was very tempting to think that maybe a similar process was going on in the axon. Perhaps myosin was coating the surface of membrane organelles, and it was transporting uh, these membrane organelles along actin filaments inside the axon. So Mike and I wanted to test this idea uh, with a very simple experiment, which was to inject 
uh, these myosin-coated beads inside of an axon and see if they would move, see if they would be transported along actin filaments. So to do this, we had to find a good experimental organism. And we chose uh, the granddaddy of all axons, which is the giant axon uh, from the squid, which has an axon about 50 times bigger in diameter than a mammalian axon. So the next step was to get some squid. So I called uh, the Hopkins Marine Station in Monterey and asked them if they would be able to provide some squid for these experiments. And they said, sure, we'd be very happy to do that. We'll give you a call when we make a catch of squid. Well, weeks went by. In fact, months went by, and we never got a phone call from uh, Hopkins Marine Station. So eventually, I called them in June, and I said, well, you know, where's our squid? And they said, well, you know, we've been trying to catch them, but it's been a very unusual year. We, we've been trying to fish for them, simply haven't been able to catch any. And indeed, that was an unusual year as shown in this graph of the amount of squid that was caught uh, in California over various years. And uh, that year was 1983, where there, were, there was a pre precipitous decline in the amount of squid that were caught. And we now know why. In 1983, there was an unusual meteorological phenomenon, which is called El Nino, that warmed the coast of California. And when the water warmed, the squid just disappeared. So, this seemed like incredibly bad luck. However, this bad luck turned into, in fact, good luck in the end, as I'll describe to you. And in fact, it's, it's funny to think, but I, I perhaps owe a, a lot of the luck that I've had in my uh, scientific career uh, to this El Nino phenomenon. Because what El Nino did was to force us to change our plans uh, and move and do the experimental work at this beautiful location which is the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole. Now, not only was there a lot of squid uh, at the MBL in Massachusetts, but there was also incredibly exciting research going on at the time. Indeed, an entire new revolution in microscopy that was uh, developed independently uh, by Robert Allen and Shinya Inoue. And what these scientists did was instead of looking through the microscope with, with your eyes, they attached a video camera and also used computers to enhance the contrast of these images and saw details inside of cells that were never seen before by microscopy. And um, Alan, Brady, and Lassick used this kind of microscopy technique to investigate uh, axonal transport in the squid. And they made these amazing movies uh, such as shown here, where you can see now all of these fine details of small organelles being transported up and down in this axon. So the, for the first time, axonal transport could be directly visualized. So this was all very exciting. But again, we had some bad news right when we arrived at uh, Woods Hole. And I opened up this issue of Nature and found out, uh, to my great surprise, that someone else did the experiment that we wanted to do. They took uh, foreign particles, which are in fact uh, beads, small plastic beads, and micro-injected them into uh, an, an axon and found that they were rapidly transported inside the axon. Except it wasn't exactly the experiment that we wanted to do because these were not myosin-coated beads. These were inert beads that had nothing on them. And in fact, this was a mystery. And the investigators themselves couldn't explain it. They thought, well, maybe there was a flow of fluid going on inside the axon, and these beads got caught up in this fluid flow. Or perhaps myosin got picked up by these beads. Or maybe they were just piggybacking on membrane organelles. So they didn't have a good idea of what, why this happened. Undaunted, we went ahead and then did our experiment with myosin-coated beads. So we took our myosin-coated beads, added it to the squid axoplasm, and the moment of truth came, and we saw nothing. The, these myosin-coated beads did not move at all. Uh, so that was disappointing. We then still had these control beads that didn't have any myosin at, on them, and tried them. And surprisingly, these beads moved. So we got this same strange result that these other investigators did, uh, which we couldn't explain either. But what we did know was that our original idea that uh, of these myosin-coated beads finding and moving along actin cables in the, in the squid axon 
was somehow incorrect. So we had to go back to the drawing board and develop a new plan of investigation. And uh, Mike and I did that by joining up um, with uh, Tom Reese and Bruce Schnapp. Tom had a laboratory at Woods Hole. Um, and both Tom and Bruce were exceptional electron microscopists. And Bruce also developed uh, a video microscope uh, in Tom's lab. And the four of us worked as a team to do all the experiments that I'm going to describe to you next. So first of all, uh, to probe this system uh, deeper, we took the, the inside of the squid axon out, the axoplasm, kind of broke it apart, and then found out in this dissociated axoplasm, transport still continued. But now you could see that there were individual tracks that were supporting this axonal transport. However, with the lower resolution of this video microscope, we didn't know what these tracks were. So we had to go to the electron microscope to get that detail. And uh, Tom and Bruce did this brilliant experiment where they first looked at a field of view under the video microscope and then found the same field of view under electron microscope to find out what these filaments were. And indeed, when they went to the electron microscope, they found organelles on single filaments that had the diameter and the features of microtubules. So the main tracks for axonal transport, the long distance tracks, were not actin. They were microtubules. But the question then was, oh, well, the, the motor couldn't be myosin, which only worked on actin. So some other motor had to be at play here. And we originally had some hypotheses of what that motor would be, but those hypotheses also turned out to be wrong. So we had to take an unbiased approach to understand the motor and the machinery that was driving this transport. So one way to take uh, this approach was to reconstitute the system, essentially take it apart, put it back together again, and find out what was the essential machinery uh, and perhaps the motor. So we did this by introducing tracks, which were here made from purified tubulin. We then also took the cargo, which were the membrane organelles purified from the squid giant axon, and added ATP as an energy source. And we figured that the motors were going to be bound to these membrane organelles. And when they had ATP, they would move along these microtubules. But again, disappointingly, the experiment was negative. We didn't see any movement. Well, then we rationalized, OK, maybe something is missing here. Something else is needed. So we added to this mix uh, a soluble protein fraction containing hundreds of different kinds of proteins. And to our joy, this worked. We now saw lots of membranes moving along these microtubule tracks. And this happened late at night. But before going home, we decided to do what was kind of a, a boring control experiment, just to make sure that the things that we saw that were moving were not particles coming from the soluble protein fraction, but in fact were indeed the organelles, we uh, mixed everything together, but now without the organelles. So we just added the, the microtubules, ATP, and the soluble protein fraction, expecting nothing to happen at all. But what happened blew our mind. Uh, what we saw under the microscope was that these microtubules were attaching themselves onto the glass cover slip. And they were crawling across the surface of the glass uh, like little worms. Uh, and this was, as I said, completely unexpected. We had no anticipation that this was going to happen at all. But then in thinking about this in more detail, what we thought was happening here was that in the soluble protein fraction, there were motor proteins that were just floating around in the cytosol. And they attached onto the glass surface. And they were grabbing hold of these microtubules and then transporting these microtubules across the glass surface. So suddenly, this old experiment that we did with these control beads made sense. Maybe these control beads were picking up this soluble motor protein and then moving along these microtubule tracks. So we now tested this again using our soluble protein fraction. And indeed, these beads picked up a motor from the soluble protein mix and we're moving beautifully along these microtubules. So why was this a surprise? Well, the reason is that most people in the field, including us, thought that the motor for this transport would be permanently bound either to the membrane organelles, which were the cargo, or onto the filamentous track, like the microtubule. But no one expected there to be a lot of soluble motor floating around in the cytoplasm. 
But the fact that there was a lot of soluble motor gave us an opportunity to think about now purifying the motor protein from this complex mixture of proteins. The problem was, this experiment happened at the very end of August, and I was supposed to go back to medical school in two weeks and start my clerkships. And uh, it would probably be another three years until I was going to get back to research again. So I called up Stanford, and I said, I had a very exciting experiment. I needed to keep working on it. Can I postpone my medical school clerkships? Uh, and they said, yes. So uh, that uh, fall and winter, uh, I spent trying to purify this motor protein. Uh, now, Woods Hole is a very exciting place. Lots of people there in the summer. In particular, in the 80s, there was really very few people at Woods Hole in the winter. Um, so I kind of had this interesting monastic environment of uh, just really trying to focus on this problem of purifying the motor. And of course, it was really uh, one of the most rewarding and exciting times of my life. So the experiment was really to use this motility assay in combination with protein purification techniques to identify which protein of these hundreds of proteins that were in this soluble fraction was the motor. And so you could use this motility assay for this purpose. So here are different uh, fractions coming off of a protein column. And here, each of these fractions now was assayed for motor activity. You can see this peak of uh, uh, microtubule motor activity here corresponding to this polypeptide, which had never been described before. And since it was a new type of protein, a new type of motor, we needed a name. And a lot of people ask me, where did the name kinesin come from? Well, I could tell you that it came from a phone call uh, with my mother. Uh, and indeed, my mother, uh, from the Greek group Kine, came up with the name uh, kinesin. Since 1985, uh, it's also been amazing to see how the whole field of kinesin has developed. In 1985, we knew almost nothing about how this motor uh, moved objects along microtubules. But since that time, single molecule assays were developed. It was possible to get x-rays and EM structures of kinesin, all kinds of protein engineering experiments. Uh, you know, these things done in our lab, but many laboratories around the world. And now we actually have a pretty good idea of how this motor is actually moving uh, along a microtubule track. The same thing happened in biology. At the beginning, 1985, we had one kinesin motor. But since then, many kinesin motors have been discovered. Uh, it's now known to be a large superfamily. They're known to be involved in many different roles in cell biology. Uh, and several uh, uh, neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases have been linked now to mutations in kinesin motors as well. So it's been a remarkable adventure, a remarkable journey. Uh, this detective story that I told you about had moments of uh, frustration uh, when we couldn't get squid. We had times when we had results we simply couldn't explain. But there were also these fantastic eureka moments that you really will remember for the rest of your life. And also an opportunity to really dig into a problem and emerge with a satisfying mechanism. Now, what about my uh, career in medicine? Did, I never did go back to medical school. I never did complete my clerkships. And that was all, all for the best. I've uh, enjoyed being uh, a scientific, scientific detective, and I have uh, enjoyed all the problems I've worked on, and I hope that you will enjoy your scientific detective work as well. Thank you.